begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this another Lord's Day. We thank Thee for Thy Word. We thank Thee for Thy Spirit who is described unto us as the Spirit of Truth and the Spirit which guides us into all truth and that we therefore have a full orbed understanding of the gospel of the world of ourselves of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit we thank thee that thou hast separated this day from the other six uh, and sanctified it unto thyself and unto thy people's benefit we pray that therefore we shall be benefited, we shall be edified and sanctified this day through thy truth because thy word is truth. In the name of the Lord Jesus we pray. Amen. Let us turn to Hebrews chapter 11. And reading verses... One and two. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Um, let's not forget why we are studying Hebrews 11. And the reason is we have been, for the past who knows how many weeks, we have been looking at Isaiah 52, 7 because it is an eminent expression of the gospel. Isaiah 52, 7, the gospel in three words, thy God reigneth. Say unto Zion, thy God reigneth. We are always in preaching we're speaking to the people of God. We're either speaking to the people of God as the people of God or we're speaking to the people of God who shall be brought into the kingdom. Other sheep have I which are not of this fold. They shall brought it, be brought in from the outside. And we're looking at Hebrews, excuse me, at Isaiah 52, 7 because of... Uh, Psalm 96. Notice it's, it's interesting, though we see the stark similarity, usually we say stark contrast, though we see the um, similarity between Psalm 96.10 and Isaiah 52.7, there is a difference between the two. I hope you will notice. Say unto Zion, Isaiah 52.7, Thy God reigneth, Psalm 92, excuse me, Psalm 96.10 says, Say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth. Isn't that interesting? Uh, though we see a great similarity between the two, we see a difference here, do we not? Say unto Zion, thy God reigneth. Say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth. And so once again, in speaking to the heathen, in speaking to the nations other than Israel, we are saying, um, the Lord reigneth, which if they end up being those of his kingdom, he shall be their God. And uh, maybe some of you are thinking right now, I'm glad we finished Isaiah 52, 7. Well, we will never be out of Isaiah 52.7 because we're never out of the gospel, which is our working definition of which is that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Our assignment in our Galatians Bible study for next week is for all of us to find a verse in the Old Testament which is a clear statement of the gospel. So at this time we're not going to go to the Old Testament. But I thought I might mention a couple of verses. In the New Testament. Which express this same idea. 
What is the gospel? It's a proclamation as to how God can receive sinners unto himself and maintain his justice that he might be just and the justifier. John 3.16 The gospel is not in the front of the verse, it's in the back of the verse. Uh, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. If God is a just God, realizing who you are in light of the gospel condemns you. You must perish. Should not perish. But how is it possible for God to be just and I not perish? 1 John 1, 5, as we said yesterday, this is the message which we have heard of him and declaring to you that God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. Once we discover by the grace of God through the law that we are not only dark but darkness. How is it possible for God to remain light and to receive us as John 14 tells us. Receive us unto himself. Or 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Why is it that the Lord of glory had to come to earth so that we might have hope of everlasting life? And the reason that God being just can I justify us without at one and the same time satisfying his law, maintaining his justice? So by way of recap, God insists on his law and therefore we have or we realize that in Adam we have fallen into a state of guilt. When at the fall, man fell into a state of guilt and he fell into a state of dominion. And the problem of the guilt of sin was solved by the doctrine, as we said, of propitiation. He is the propitiation for our sins. He is the appeasement of the wrath of God with respect to the sins of the elect. Not for ours only, but also for all those scattered throughout the world. And then secondly, as a result of the fall, we not only fell into a state of guilt, an objective state of guilt, we also fell into a subjective state of dominion. And we discovered that Christ hath delivered us not only from the guilt of sin by propitiating the wrath of God with respect to us, but he also delivered us from the dominion of sin through the doctrine of regeneration and the continuing doctrine of regeneration, which is the doctrine of sanctification, which is only a continuation. Once you have life, that life continues, which is called sanctification. And both of these, we said, are the result, our state of guilt and our state of deliverance are both, or both emanate from the fact that God reigns. He reigns by his law, which brings us into a state of guilt. Otherwise, if he didn't reign by, if he didn't insist on his law, maybe we're going to be all right after all. And the fact that God insists on his law, he reigns by his law, his law is his scepter. We are therefore delivered from. What an amazing thing the gospel is. We can never get over it. The same law which brings us into a state of guilt delivers us from a state of being under the dominion of sin because God reconciles us to himself, subjectively speaking. And the tendency... After that is to say, or it can be, what do we then, since salvation is of the Lord, 
It is Christ who has delivered us from the guilt of sin. It is Christ who has delivered us from the dominion of sin. Therefore, well, what do we do? Now the legalist says, we do everything. Yeah. What do we do therefore since salvation of the Lord? Uh, we do everything. And when I was a kid, they used to say constantly, let Jesus be the Lord of your life. The antinomian says, since it is God and God alone who delivers us from guilt and delivers us from dominion, the antinomian says, we do nothing. Salvation is by grace. The Bible says, contrary to both of these false views, the Bible says, we believe. Let's look at, um, well, um, a, a friend of mine uh, is speaking today on Luke 6. Um, let's look at the end of, the, end of uh, Luke chapter 6. This is a passage he's speaking on today. And uh, very interestingly, in dealing with this question we're bringing up now, what did this sense? Salvation is totally of God. None of us. Is there nothing for me to do? The legalist says there's everything for you to do. The antinomian says there is nothing for you to do. In fact, their Christ, the antinomian Christ, keeps them total, supports their total depravity. Luke 6, 47, Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He's like a man which built a house and digged deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it for it was founded upon a rock. What is there for us to do? There is... What does Luke 6, 48 say? He is like a man which built an house and digged deep and laid the foundation on a rock. God saves us through much industry on our part. And yet, the amazing thing is that though, uh, and, and once again, Hebrews eleven six, 6, but without faith it is impossible, same idea, it is impossible to please him for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Dig deep and lay the foundation on the rock. Salvation is the result of much industry. However, the amazing thing is that after the much industry, He saves us through industry in such a way that we can take no credit for the industry. One of the amazing aspects of the gospel. So we're dealing with the importance of faith in Hebrews 11. We said that uh, faith is important because it unites us with Christ who alone delivers us from the guilt of sin. said faith is important. Faith is important because it unites us with Christ who alone delivers us from the dominion of sin. And as we hope to see today, uh, what we want to point out today, one of the main things is that the, the relationship between faith and unity, faith unifies, faith is a, a connector. Remember the illustration of the reservoir that's, an, that's a mile away from our house and, and we being in our house that we need the water, but the water is not here and the faith is a conduit as it were. It connects us, even in the natural realm. For example, think about this. This is really interesting. In the natural realm, when you are driving your car and you're coming up onto a red light, you assent to the fact that that brake is going to keep you from hitting the car in front of you. And it's almost second nature, as they say. It's so natural. But that ascent 
that that brake pedal is going to keep you from hitting the car in front of you connects you to that idea. Your ascent connects you to it. Your ascent uh, in winter connects you to the fact that if you go outside without a coat, you're going to get sick. And so you almost, as we say, second nature, it comes natural to you to put on a coat in the winter because your ascent connects you to the reality. Or, to give another illustration, these things are so natural to us, it's hard to analyze them. Uh, but, uh, in the natural realm, your ascent to the fact that if you fall off a 15-story building, you're going to die. It naturally keeps you away from the edge of the building. You see that? So faith is a conduit, even in the natural realm. In the spiritual realm, faith is also a conduit. And what is it? As faith unites us to the natural world around us in so, so, so many ways. So it is that faith unites us something to something in the spiritual realm. And what is it that faith unites us to in the spiritual realm? It is Christ. Uh, and as a result, we naturally... Through our union with Christ, it doesn't happen instantly. It happens gradually. As we said, a justification is punctiliar. What do we mean by that? It is a one-time act. Sanctification, however, is a process. We are delivered from the natural realm, though we still assent to that which keeps us in the natural realm, keeps us from dying and leaving the natural realm. We are delivered from the natural realm gradually by the conduit which connects us to Christ. One of the most eminent illustrations of this is found in Mark 9.24. You remember the guy who in response to our, the words of our Lord who said unto him in Mark 9, 23, Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And what did the guy say? And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. What an excellent illustration of what we're talking about. Faith unites us in the spiritual realm. It unites us to its object, just as it does in the physical realm. And yet, at the same time, we must say with Scripture, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Faith is a process. Sanctification is a process of being delivered from this world and from love of the world. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is of the, of the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father but of the world. And the world passes away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. And so faith delivers us gradually from the world and unites us to the spiritual realm in Christ. Unites us to Christ. We said that faith is the gasoline on which the engine of sanctification works. Which brings us to Hebrews 11. One, and let's read it once again. Hebrews 11, 1 and 2. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. And you will notice as we go through Hebrews 11, the amazing, one of the amazing aspects of faith is that uh, faith is miraculous. It's miraculous. It's, it isn't something that comes naturally. As we shall see in all the illustrations that the author of Hebrews 
gives us. And faith is not only miraculous, but faith is, as we just tried to point out, faith is deliverance. As we have said before, salvation is deliverance from the dominion of sin. As we noted in Colossians 1, uh, 12 and 13, giving thanks unto the Father with hath, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life, who hath delivered us. Faith is deliverance. Faith is not only miraculous, it is miraculous because it delivers us from the dominion of sin, from which dominion we cannot deliver ourselves, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Faith uniting us to Christ is at one and the same time a deliverance from, it unites us to the kingdom of Christ, it delivers us from the kingdom of darkness. What do we pray for in the second petition? Thy kingdom come. We pray that Satan's kingdom may be destroyed in ourselves. And that the kingdom of grace may be advanced. Ourselves and others brought into it and kept in it. And that the kingdom of glory may be hastened. We are now in the process of we have been delivered from the kingdom of darkness. We are in the kingdom of grace and we shall be in the kingdom of glory. Which is the final deliverance from the world which is the final deliverance from the kingdom of Satan though we have been delivered from it we fight as it were the good fight of faith we see in just quickly a, a few brief illustrations of that which we're going to be studying to show that faith is not only miraculous but faith is deliverance in verse 8 we see by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place, he should, have, he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. What kind of a fool would do that? Would leave his place of birth. Isn't it amazing? Do you, have you noticed this? The people that we grew up with, almost to a person, I say almost to a person, this is, uh, what, over 40 years ago. They're still living in that same radius or diameter of however, 20 miles. And yet Abraham is commanded to go out and he went out. Not because he knew there was a better uh, destiny. He went out not knowing whithersoever he went. It's a miracle. Secondly, in verse 7, by faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Noah, went, Noah obeyed God, though at the time there was no such thing as rain. And yet his faith, the faith which God gave him, was a miraculous belief. And it, once again, it united him to the spiritual realm. It delivered him from the natural realm. Or the realm of the world. The thinking of the world. Abraham's faith did the same thing. Moses in verse 25. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. The natural man cannot conceive of this happening, of a person choosing to forego all the accoutrements of Egypt and all the riches, the power, the position, and everything he had. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. Faith is miraculous. It's impossible for that to happen. And verse 16 tells us why. But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared 
for them a city. They left, as it were, their own city. Augustine, we were just listening to a sermon. The guy was pointing out the, the book that Augustine wrote, The City of God. There is the city of evil and there is the city of God. God delivered them. That was their sanct. That was their deliverance from the dominion of sin. Abraham's deliverance, Noah's deliverance, Moses' deliverance. The miraculous, which united them to a different object. And then we go back to the context of Hebrews 11, which... Um, is found in Hebrews 10 before we get to Hebrews 11 and let's just read this briefly to give us a context of what we're talking about in Hebrews 11 faith is a substance of things hoped for what is faith what is the importance of faith Hebrews 10 beginning with verse 28 he that despised Moses law died without mercy under two or three witnesses of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. We were talking about yesterday this very verse. How is it possible that these, is he talking, he's talking about people who shall uh, finally end up in hell. He says that they were sanctified, counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and had done despite in the spirit of grace. He was sanctified. The whole nation of Israel was sanctified. God gave them his law. And yet, some of them were never delivered from the world. Verse 30, For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But call to remembrance the former days in which after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of afflictions, partly whilst ye were made a gazing stop, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst ye became companions of them that were so used. For ye had compassion of me in my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have, once again, we just read uh, Hebrews eleven sixteen. This is the same idea. Knowing, it connects you to the spiritual realm. Knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Substance, the first verse of Hebrews 11. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. A person doesn't ever change his mind. Think about this principle. A person doesn't change his mind. He doesn't go in a different direction unless he believes that the direction he's going in now is a better direction. Which hath great recompense of reward. Why do we not love the world? Because we know that we have a better inheritance. Not better with respect to a difference in degree, but with respect to a difference in kind. The only reward that is. And if you notice in that passage you were just reading from Luke 6, it says, he that the man that didn't dig deep and build his foundation on a rock, what does it say of that man that didn't dig deep and build his, self, his foundation on a rock? It says, he that without a foundation. We don't have a better reward. We have the only reward. For ye have need of patience that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. There it is again. What is our working definition of a Christian? These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth because they had a better, which is to say, a difference in kind. Reward. Notice how he repeats that again and again in that one verse. 
not having received the promises, which is the promise of the Messiah, and which is exactly what we're told in verse 36. For ye have need of patience that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise which we already have through faith. We're connected to it for yet a little while. And he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. Shall live by faith. It's not just a one-time act. It's not just punctilier. We're going to see that in a few seconds as we read a quote from John Owen. An amazing thing. How all this stuff fits together. This is exactly the same thing we've been talking about in Isaiah 52, 7. That this uh, faith which justifies the same faith which justifies also sanctifies. That's exactly what he's saying in verse 38. Now the just shall not only be delivered by, from the guilt of sin by faith, but he shall live by faith. In sanctification, not only justification, but sanctification. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure. Draw back from what? How can you draw back from something that you never had? Good question. It's the same question we just asked with respect to verse 28. And this is one reason why the Baptists, who are by nature, by definition dispensationalists they can't understand the bible they can't understand they have to come up with their explanation of john 3 16 for god so love the world because they don't understand this principle but if any man draw back if any of you all of you have been sanctified god sanctified you this ethnicity of israel by giving you his law and if any man draw back from that, which some of you never were individually in the covenant, but you were by the reason of your flesh members of the ethnicity of Israel. If any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back under petition. Draw back is not just draw back. Draw back is to draw back unto perdition. To demonstrate that you never were. What does Christ say in Matthew 7, 23? But depart from me, ye cursed. I never knew you. To demonstrate the fact that Christ never knew them. Draw back unto perdition. We are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Now we get to Hebrews 11, verse 1. We are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Now faith. It's the substance of things hoped for. What does that tell us? Right away, right off the bat. What is faith? Which is what we get to now. The importance of faith. And frequently, we see the importance of something when we consider what it is to be without it. If you stop breathing for uh, probably the longest you can do that is about two minutes or close to that. If you stop breathing for about two minutes, you'll see how important it is, uh, how important oxygen is because you see what it is to be without it. And so it is with faith. Hebrews 11.6, which we just quoted, but without faith. Here is how important faith is. We see how important it is by considering what it would be without faith. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. I remember the time 
the first time or the first time I noticed it couldn't have been the first time I read it growing up in the church but the first time I noticed the importance of Romans 14 17 which is said which tells us the kingdom of God but without faith it is impossible to please him the kingdom of God is not there it is again the natural realm the spiritual realm faith is miraculous because it delivers us from the natural realm it delivers us from thinking in accordance with the world the kingdom of God is not me and drink but there you go the antithesis it is not meat and drink but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost I remember writing in my Bible at the time the first time I recognized this what does this mean and I could still write in my Bible what does this mean the kingdom of God is not meat and drink but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost how important is faith do you see what you would be without it it is impossible to please him righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost look at what is happening in our country and one of the main reasons is they have healed the church. They've healed the heart, the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Without faith, there is none, none of the above. What is the first question of the catechism? I almost hesitate to, re to recite it because that's the only one they ever mention the Calvinists. But it is important. What is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to, what's the next word? Enjoy Him forever. There is no enjoyment. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man. The thinking of the world but the end thereof are the ways of death. In all their superficial enjoyments, there is, as the Puritans used to say, there's a fly in the ointment. Because there is no joy apart from faith. Matthew 25, 21. Matthew 25, 21. At the end of the world, at the final judgment, his Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful, full of faith. Thou hast been one who has exercised faith which connected you to the spiritual realm, which delivered you from the natural realm. Over a few things, I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. There it is. Faith connects us, unites us. Faith is the conduit that unites us to the promise. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. We have it now. And as, once again, the Puritans used to say constantly, now, 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, we walk by faith. Then, when we shall enter into the full, the final, the completion, the state of glory, we shall walk by sight. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. And as we said, we're going to quote from John Owen. Let's listen to what he says at, in his uh, 
commentary on Hebrews with respect to this passage. He says, It is, speaking of faith, it is therefore justifying faith, speaking of Hebrews chapter 11, the first verse, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. He says that the Apostle Paul, which we believe to be the author of Hebrews, it is therefore justifying faith that the Apostle here speaks concerning, but he speaks not of it as justifying. See that? It is justifying faith that he's talking about, but he's not speaking of it as it justifies. He doesn't speak of it as justifying, but as it is effectually useful in our whole life unto God, especially as unto constancy and perseverance in profession. So in other words, he's telling us that the same faith which justifies, the faith which justifies, the faith which delivers us from the guilt of sin is the same faith that has delivered us and is delivering us from the dominion of sin. It's the same faith. And on the previous page, he says, this being the design of the apostle, the missing of it, the missing of, what, of it, what is it to be without this faith, hath caused sundry contests among expositors and others about the nature of justifying faith, which is not here at all spoken of. He's not speaking of faith as it justifies. For the apostle treats not in this place of justification or of faith as justifying or of its interest in justification, but of its efficacy and operation in them that are already justified with respect unto constancy and perseverance in their profession notwithstanding the difficulties which they have to conflict with all in the same way as it is treated of in James 2. This is exactly what we've been... They see the unity of Scripture. The exact, John Owen is saying the exact same thing we've been saying for weeks and weeks and weeks in Isaiah 52, 7. Say unto Zion, thy God reigneth. He reigns in delivering us from the guilt of sin without which reign using his law we would never be in a state of guilt he delivers us from the guilt of sin he also delivers us through the reign of his law from the dominion of sin and the and the relationship between these two phenomena the guilt of sin and the dominion of sin owen says he's not speaking of per se, here, of faith as it justifies, but of faith as it sanctifies, yet it is the same faith that sanctifies as that which justifies. So first of all, we want to deal with the definition of faith, which we're not given, or yes, we are. I just caught myself. Many expositors tell us that right, most, maybe, maybe all of them, and they're right, but they tell us that Hebrews 11.1 1 is not a definition of faith. It is a description of faith in the whole chapter, basically. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. But I say we do have a definition because look at the last verse before we got to... Hebrews 11, the last verse of Hebrews 10. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Now watch this. I'm going to go from verse 39 to Hebrews 11, 1. Very quickly for effect. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Now faith. What's the definition of faith? It's belief. You say, well, that's obvious. No, hey, it, no, it isn't. Not in our day and age. They say, oh yeah, uh, uh, saving faith includes three aspects. It's knowledge, it's assent, and it is trust. Well, 
Assent and trust are one and the same, which we were told here in verse 39 of chapter 10 and verse 1 of chapter 11. Faith is what? What is the definition of faith? We're told indirectly in John 1. But as many as received him. Listen carefully. What is the definition of faith? But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Even that believe. Even to them that believe on his name. What is the definition of faith? Faith is to have faith is to receive whatever is in question. To receive it as true. He that cometh to God must believe. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. To believe is to receive something as true. Now we're frequently told in the church, we have been or I have been ever since I was a little kid. Oh, faith, faith, faith is simple. Everybody has faith. That's a dangerous statement because it's true and false at the same time. It must be explained. Oh, faith? Faith is simple. Everybody has faith. When you came in the room today, you had faith in your chair because you sat down in your chair. You didn't examine your chair before you sat in it. That proves that you had faith in your chair. Everybody had faith. So what comes next? Now what you need to do is you need to take that faith and exercise it on Jesus. Well, that's the way that it's false to say that everybody has faith because what they're saying is this. All you need to do, faith isn't miraculous. In other words, that's what they're, they're saying, the exact opposite of Scripture. Oh, faith, that's simple. All you need to do is take the faith that you already have in your chair and exercise it on Christ. The only problem with that is as soon as you remove the object of faith, the faith also disappears. He said, uh, everybody has faith. Uh, and, and here's another example. Here's, what they, here's another expression. They say, if you're here tonight and you've never accepted Jesus, you need to place, and you, if you're here tonight and you haven't become a Christian, and you're not a Christian, you need to place your faith in Jesus Christ. What do they mean by that? Place, okay, place your faith. That means I have it, all right, I need to take this thing called faith, and I need to place it in Jesus Christ. And my response to that is this. It might sound strange to you, but meditate on it, and it's true. My response is this. When they say, you need to place your faith in Jesus Christ, my response is this. Listen carefully. Place my faith in what? In Jesus Christ. Because faith never exists without an object. So that faith that you're talking about is a faith in something. Place your faith in Jesus Christ. Place my faith in what? In Jesus Christ. And that gives the lie to that statement. Because as soon as whatever faith it is that you're saying I have, as soon as the object of that faith, maybe my chair, is removed, the faith disappears at one and the same time. It is true to say that's the way that it's false to say everybody has faith. Nobody. Faith is to receive. What did we say? Faith, the definition of faith is to receive as true. No, faith is propositional. Faith can only believe in propositions. We just read last week, did we not? That famous theologian, reformed theologian, who says it's not enough to believe in correct doctrine about Christ. It's not enough. What he's saying is it's not enough to believe the gospel. You need to believe in the person of Christ. Well, as soon as I, as soon as he asked me that, I say, with the person of which Christ? And now we're back into doctrine. Faith is propositional by definition. To receive as true. To receive some proposition as true. For example, now, here's how it's true to say that everybody has faith. Everybody believes that water freezes, if he's been in the world very long. Water freezes by getting it cold. Water freezes at 32 degrees or thereabouts. And so, 
in order to make ice cubes for your cold drink, you don't put water in a pot and put it on the stove. Which is to say, you receive, that's what you believe. Everybody believes that water freezes at 32 degrees. And so you act on that. You receive it as true. Secondly, not only the importance of faith as seen by what happens when we're without it. Secondly, the consequences of not believing. Uh, we just said, in the natural realm, the consequences of not having faith in the natural realm. You're not going to be around for too long. If you don't assent to the fact that in order to avoid hitting the car in front of you, you don't step on the gas pedal, you step on the brake. In the natural realm, the consequences of not believing. Uh, you, uh, what is that statement we've said before? Little Billy took a drink, but he will drink no more. For what he thought was H2O was in fact H2SO4. The fact that you believe. That not all clear liquids are water. Hello. Everybody believes it. And so they act on it. If they see some clear li liquid in a container, especially in a science classroom, he's not going to just gulp it down real fast, even if he's really thirsty. Why? Because what he thought was H2O was H2SO4. Not all clear liquids are water. And to not believe that in the natural realm is fatal. And so it is in the spiritual realm. Of which the natural realm is mere metaphor. People say, and this is why the, um, in my view, how did the OPC, which is apostate, and how did the PCA, which is apostate, how did they start? They began in apostasy. And this is what happened, according to my understanding. They reacted against what they called liberalism. They re reacted against denial of certain uh, doctrines. For example, they founded the PCA, they founded the OPC because the Presbyterian Church had become apostate in their view. It was apostate because they stopped believing in doctrines such as the infallibility of the scripture. They stopped believing in doctrines such as the deity of Christ. They stopped believing in doctrines such as the incarnation of Christ. And so we're going to leave those guys. We're going to found our own de denomination because they're apostate. That sounds good on the surface, but when you realize, when you get under the surface, you realize that they did not... The, the reason that the denomination had become apostate was not that they began to deny the infallibility of Scripture, not because they began to deny the deity of Christ, and not because they did began to deny the incarnation of Christ. The reason they were apostate was the significance of those terms. Because without the infallibility of Scripture, there is no gospel. Without the deity of Christ, there is no gospel. Without the miracles, there's no gospel. That's the thing that they missed. So, the consequences of not believing. The consequences of not believing what? Not believing the gospel. Not believing the gospel is denial of the T, of total depravity. Because, as the theologians have said of old, all five points stand or fall together. Denying the you, unconditional election. Denying limited atonement. Denying irresistible grace or denying perseverance of the saints. Any of which results in, die, in denying all of which. Thirdly, the importance of what we call Hebrew parallelism in the passage. I'll have to admit I never noticed it before this week. Hebrew parallelism in Hebrews 11. Listen carefully and you'll see it immediately. Once somebody, it's like a lot of other things. 
You never noticed something before, but when somebody points it out, hey, you see that thing up in the sky? Did you ever know? No, I never noticed that before. I've seen it about a thousand times. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrew, in order to understand Scripture, especially the Old Testament, but also, as we're going to see, in the New Testament, one of the main uh, benefits or the main uh, aids in understanding Scripture, since Scripture wasn't written by Englishmen or Americans, is understanding the concept of Hebrew parallelism, both in the Old Testament and, as we're going to see now, in the New Testament. You have two statements, uh, parallel, as it were, to one another. Hebrew parallelism, they mean the same thing, and they're stated back to back. Notice which we don't have in English. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith, we'll insert, faith is the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. The two statements are parallel. They mean the same thing. Substance on the one hand. In the second statement, evidence. Substance is evidence. Things hoped for. In the first statement, things not seen. In the second statement, things hoped for are things not seen. You see how, how helpful that is to understand Scripture. And we're going to look at a few instances of Hebrew. We're not going to, have, we're not going to be able to finish this sermon today. I don't think so. But uh, let's look at a few instances of the importance of Hebrew parallelism in Scripture. Psalm 95. You, sit, you, you find it everywhere in the Psalms. Hey, that's another reason to sing from this altar. <laughs> it helps you understand Scripture. Psalm 95, 1. Oh, come, listen carefully. Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. You see the parallelism? First statement, let us sing unto the Lord. Second statement, let us make a joyful noise, which is parallel to sing. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. First statement, sing unto the Lord. Second statement, make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Interestingly enough, notice carefully, this is one of the main reasons why Hebrew parallelism is so important. And that is, it is a teaching device. Um... It is a pedago pedagogical. I had to teach uh, when I, I majored in music in college, and I had to uh, teach, uh, or I had a course called vocal pedagogy, pedagogical device. It is a teaching device. Notice carefully. Frequently, though, we're going to see in, in in Hebrews eleven one. This is a little bit different, but frequently, uh, the importance of Hebrew parallelism is seen in the fact that the second statement inserts something that's slightly different from the first statement. Let me, and as we see here, O oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord. Uh, excuse me, uh, I'm reading the wrong uh, song. O oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. So what we're seeing, what we see here is that Lord is equated with rock of our salvation. The Lord is the rock of our salvation. So to believe in Psalm 95, 1, to believe in the Hebrew parallel, to believe in the fact that these two statements are parallel is to believe that to, to believe that Christ is Lord is to believe that your salvation didn't come from you because he's the rock. Of our salvation. Psalm 97 9. Psalm 97 9, another instance. Hebrew parallel. For thou, Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all gods. You see, once again, something slightly different, though the statements are parallel. Do you notice that? For thou, Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted, high, corresponding to exalted. Thou art high above the earth. Thou art exalted, far above all gods. 
Notice carefully, all the earth is parallel to all gods. That tells us something extremely important. What's he talking about? He's talking about the same thing we're talking about. The gods, thou art exalted above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all gods. One of the main differences between a Christian and a non-Christian is the non-Christian worships the natural realm. He worships the gods of the earth. Um, somebody said one time, instead of uh, Psalm 24, one where it says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. They changed it to the natural man sees it like this. Instead of the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, apostrophe S, they believe the earth is the Lord. Environmentalism. The earth is the Lord. They worship the earth. They worship the natural realm. Psalm 21, 1. The king shall joy in thy strength, O Lord, and in thy salvation. Now they reverse the order, but it's still Hebrew parallelism. The king shall joy in thy strength, O Lord, and in thy salvation. How greatly shall he rejoice. He rejoices in thy strength. He rejoices in thy salvation. Once again, what an amazing thing is taught there. Salvation is strength. Salvation is deliverance from something that you couldn't possibly deliver yourself from. As, he, as Ephesians 1, 19 and 20 tells us, the same power it took to raise Christ from the dead, it takes to raise you from the dead. And then finally, Psalm 21, 10. I was cast upon thee. Excuse me, Psalm 21, 10. Their fruit shall thou destroy from the earth and their seed from among the children of men. Their fruit shalt thou destroy from the earth and their seed from among the the children of men. This is, more, this is more closely related to the parallelism that we find, once again, in Hebrews 11.1. 1. You'll notice that Hebrews, the, parale the Hebrew parallelism in Hebrews 11.1 1 is, is, is more closely akin to an exact parallel, which is to say that uh, okay, so then you ask the question, if the two statements are exactly parallel, why isn't it a redundancy? Why isn't it a tautology? Why isn't the author needlessly repeating himself? What good does it do to say, faith is the substance of things hoped for, it is the evidence of things not seen? Well, I think the... The, the, the most important answer is that the emphasis on the fact of faith being substance of things hoped for. Faith is substance of things hoped for. Substance sounds like evidentialism. We said... We're going to have to, we'll say this and then we'll end. Have to continue this next week. But the importance of this subject, the importance of faith as it regards our sanctification. We said that faith is the gas on which our sanctification runs. Um, it sounds like, once you read Hebrews 11, 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things. The evidence of things not seen. And so we need evidence. Uh, we said uh, the, the two basic positions in uh, apologetics are evidentialism and presuppositionalism. It sounds like evidentialism, doesn't it, on the surface. In fact, it is the exact opposite of evidentialism because this substance that we're that is talked about in Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. 
the evidence of things. The reason evidentialism is a lie is evidentialism uses this realm to show the realm, the, 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 the next realm, the spiritual. It uses the natural realm, it attempts to use the natural realm to prove the supernatural realm when there are two completely different realms. The substance spoken of in Hebrews 11, 1, it's the substance of things hoped for. And, of course, now we see why there are evidentialists as opposed to presuppositionalists. Because the evidentialists haven't been delivered from this realm. So they try to use this realm to prove the next realm. They don't, they don't have any concept of the next realm. So that's all they can do. It doesn't surprise us, does it? So the importance of Hebrew parallelism. And then next week, Lord willing, we want to discuss, since faith is so important as, and is all important, faith in what? Since the definition of faith is to receive something as true, what is it that is the object of our faith? It is not the natural realm. We know it is not the natural realm. It is the spiritual realm. As we said, as it, just as in the natural realm, your faith connects you, unites you to the object of your faith. You want me to prove it? You don't put water on the stove when you want ice cubes for your drink. And in the spiritual realm, you don't believe in a false God. To unite you to the spiritual realm. You believe in the true God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for this another day that thou hast given us. We thank thee for this wonderful concept of faith. We thank thee that thou hast given us an understanding. And we know, 1 John 5 says, that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding, has given us faith. That we might know him that is true. The object of our faith is the Lord Jesus Christ and the Lord Jesus Christ alone. That we might know Him that is true and we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. We thank Thee that Thou hast given us this faith. We pray that Thou hast, in this journey of seeking to understand more and more just what it is that is so important about faith, we pray that Thou wouldst be with us, guide us, illuminate our minds, cause us to be more and more, as the old Puritans used to say, to hold this world, to grasp this world with a light hand, to be more and more delivered from this world and more and more united to the world to come through the faith that thou dost give us in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the promised one. And in his name we pray. Amen. Okay, that's right. Mm -hmm. Right, we get ready. You guys got a two